Hi guys, today we are having a very interesting conversation, a very good continuation to the fixed asset investment class. Uh, it's about uh, dead asset. So these are maybe housing, land, and uh, asset classes that you hardly know anything about, but there are some lessons on some of the features and factors that you need to consider before putting your money in it. I hope you'll enjoy and learn. Feel free to, of course, um, put in your opinion, your comments, and uh, share, like, and subscribe. And uh, if you'd like to open a trading account with FX Pesa, make sure to check uh, the comment section uh, or the description section. You'll find the links to open a demo uh, live account and uh, this will help you get in started with your trading journey. Hi guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are. And uh, most importantly, I hope you enjoyed the previous episode on uh, fixed income uh, with the bonds. I think after the conversation we had, uh, uh, there was an up rise in the yield returns to the treasury bonds. So for those who are interested, I hope you learned one or two things. As usual, I'm joined by... Uh, Rufus here. Hi, guys. Yeah. How are you doing, Rufus? <coughs> I'm doing fine. Yeah. Did you go ahead and get into the juicy tod or you are still waiting to see if the GOK will be able to pay those who hold those assets? Uh, definitely, that's not the market for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, today we are continuing with this type of alternative investments, of course, maybe what you can do with your income from your trading or any other investments. Uh, we are turning over to what I know has been quite contentious and most importantly, an emotional uh, asset class, land and uh, housing. Definitely. Um, this reminds me of a trend uh, that was going around on Facebook as well as on Twitter, X. Yeah. And uh, it was under the hashtag dead capital. Yeah. So it started where people started discussing uh, how much uh, investments they have made in their rural areas. And uh, it was quite a surprise seeing a lot of uh, Luo, Kikuyu, Kalenjin guys uh, with uh, multi-million homes mm -hmm. uh, that they have built at home. Uh, they are really good, nice homes. Uh, some of them you would never imagine they would be there. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> yeah. You know, there has been this uh, narrative over time. Yes. But uh, the Kikuyu guys uh, invest back at home. Uh -huh. uh, the Luo guys don't invest back at home. Yes. But then from what we are seeing, it's quite surprising that there's a lot of young people who have invested in uh, really good homes and they are rural villages. Yeah. Um, for me, given I come from those sides, uh, um, back in the years, uh, early 2000s, people are mostly um, investing in where their careers are best. So if you live in Nairobi, you make sure you have a very nice home in, in Nairobi. Yeah. You make sure you have a few businesses in Nairobi mm -hmm. that are, act as a passive income source. Eh? Yes. But uh, uh, so two things happened. The 2007 post-election violence when people had to go back home away from the hot zone, hot spots in, in, in the different regions in Kenya. Yeah. And that is why people are like, you go home and you do not have a place to hold fought at least for the foreseeable time the the, the violence was going on everywhere. Yes. So after that, people okay, so started, okay, must build a home just in case it ever happens again, knowing the election circles in Kenya and how it turns sometimes violence, I must have a place where I can say, I will relax. If you have a family, a big family, you can host them without ever worrying. So I think part, two things can be at play here. One is security. Yes. The other one is maybe you just want to have a place where on retirement you go back home. Yeah, but the homes uh, seemed a little bit recent. So yes, yes, that's do you think COVID nineteen has had something to do with it? Yeah, I think that's another. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, how do I put it? A trigger or an accelerator. Yeah. COVID nineteen. Maybe you have lost your job. You have to go back home because you can't pay rent in Nairobi. And most importantly, you cannot get maybe the common things like food. So you want maybe to have a big home but a small farm to. Yeah. So those three factors I think have played a big role in yeah, the I rise think... of dead capital. I think a lot of people had a lot of time. Either you are working from uh, home, uh, mostly let's say you are a rural village, uh, you find you don't have a really nice house, uh, you have excess savings, but somehow you could not put this into business. Uh, businesses were not doing well under lockdowns. So a lot of people decided, uh, let's use this time and use these savings to build a really nice house uh, for me to settle either in retirement or whenever another eventuality happens, where I may not be able to work in Nairobi or any uh, 
<coughs> urban center. Yeah, so uh, I think we are starting from the point of an insurance policy. Somebody is getting himself an insurance home just in case whatever happens, yeah. at least uh, uh, you are safe and yes. you are comfortable. I think going back home, maybe you are living in car in a very nice uh, uh, seven bedroom and then you go back home to a bed sitter or even a, a small kahat. It yeah. doesn't really look good and maybe you are a person of high status in the society. Yeah. So when you call maybe your friends, you're like, I don't think this <laughs> <laughs> matches my name. So I think that has played a role. Now, um, there is the other side, of course, maybe the dead capital side now. You have invested, um, uh, of course, after a while, things have stabilized in Nairobi, business is booming, um, uh, the city life is very addictive. Yeah. Going back home, maybe you go for a week or something, and mostly it's between Christmas or Easter. Yes. Now, that is where the question comes in. Um, does it actually make sense to build such uh, levels of home uh, at home or maybe invest those land in other asset classes that can, say, make, uh, you know, an ROI, a very pretty ROI? That is where the problem, because you first of all, you're paying maybe for the electricity to hold yep. it there. Maybe you're paying for the recurrent bills like DSTV if you are a person who subscribes to it. So when you go home, you don't want to be streaming on funny sites. Yes. And most importantly, the water bill. So that is where now it brings the question, is it a sensible investment or maybe people should... Uh, make such an investment in a way that, yes, it has security, but it is not, let's say, a house that you hardly enjoy. Yeah, I had uh, some good time thinking about it. Uh -huh. uh, on one side, I felt like uh, having a rural home, it's a really good insurance plan. Um, uh, rather than insurance, I tend to view it as a retirement plan. So at some point, you know that you're not going to be fully active in your job, so at some point, you'll need some place to go and live. You'll need to own your own house. This is my retirement home and, uh, and so on. So traditionally, we have seen a lot of uh, people, especially in the formal sector, uh, if you are, let's say, a teacher, a policeman, uh, or whatever, uh, whatever the job you are taking, you normally save money, which is uh, officially and uh, formally deducted by the government and sent to NSF. By the time you retire... Uh, those savings are not even su sufficient to build you a home for retirement. So if you can do it when you are younger, I think it makes a lot of sense. But then, on the other hand, when you tend to view investments as vehicles that move at different speeds, then you know that that retirement home, yes, it may accelerate in value over time, but there are other things that you could do right now that could yield a much higher return compared to building that home now. So if, for instance, you have, let's say, 10 million Kenya shillings right now, would you rather go and build a house or would you invest that in your own business or in financial assets and give you a return over, let's say, the next 10, 20 or 30 years? Yeah, it's a very critical question. Yeah, I think uh, they tend to say those who are at least above, almost close to retirement, you are quite conservative with what you spend your money on, and that is common sense, common financial wisdom. And then on, on the younger side, yes, you might be aggressive perhaps in your savings, but uh, there is that element of, like I said before, the status in the society. We Africans always obviously view land and house as a, like success. Yes. Not how much money you have, but rather what is the beauty of the home. So that is one important thing. I think, or personally how I do it, obviously um, having some place where you can sleep when you go home is very important, even if it's just a small uh, Simba or a Singira or however they call it in, yes. in your local communities. And um, maybe in the future, uh, have something you call a, you know, a holiday home. Yes, I think that is what is coming. The culture is shifting such that people are getting holiday homes. And uh, it is okay. But for me, if I have such a thing, but Nairobi, you'll be seeing me mm. <laughs> once me, when you're working. By Thursday <laughs> afternoon, yeah. you're trying to find your way home. <laughs> there, and, there will be signs. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is that. Um, yeah. Secondly, there is, of course, most of these are communal land. So... Yeah. Selling them off would not really be an option for these guys. Eh? Yeah. Um, 
and also final, final sometimes people are not really willing to take the risk yes. because so it's not good to see your money go so i think there is that security that at least this one i know uh if i build it it will still be here yes. it will not go anywhere yeah maybe what other people i think i'm are doing are uh, mostly in uh agribusiness maybe yeah. instead of building a big one a small uh, to manage the home a compound like that and then the rest of the field maybe based on the pictures we have seen from that hashtag it's mostly either plantation of maize so that you just go home pick your tomatoes or your in our side maybe um uh, pineapples or watermelons or even groundnuts they do very well there so i think that is the alternatives of what i've seen a lot of people do at least from a personal experience now um is it something maybe um i would do uh, in terms of a big home like that yeah not really yeah. i think uh b&b and yeah. all these uh, hotels coming up yes makes sense financially to stay in them yes. until such a time let's say as you build a family and everything yeah. then going to the hotel doesn't really make sense yeah uh personally uh you know i've been a big pro- proponent of bitcoin uh and it's up uh, about 90% year to date and uh this is not uh, financial advice to any listeners out there <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh i'm i was trying to do this comparative analysis uh we know that uh, <clears throat> the s&p 500 has been up uh, over 20% over the year the nasdaq has hit 35% year to date so when you look at the way people have been allocating capital uh if you had allocated let's say in the nasdaq the s&p 500 would be up let's say 20 to 30% uh mm-hmm. in nine months so far. Yeah. So if you had a uh, 20 million bungalow, let's say somewhere in uh, Siaya, somewhere in Nanyuki, uh you wouldn't be able to rent that at market prices. So it's a really good home, it has a really good value. But then if you decided to rent that out, uh person in that locality would probably give you a very small amount. So it doesn't even make sense to rent. So from what I'm seeing with a couple of guys around they're basically just hiring someone to maintain the home and uh in that case you incur an extra expense to maintain your asset I would rather call it an asset but uh no, the common term is uh debt capital okay yeah now so uh-huh. looking at the returns even uh comparing with what we discussed last week uh, about bonds mm-hmm. if you just put that money in a government bond You'd, you'd be getting somewhere between 14 and 17% in a year and if it's a 10 million shillings home that would be about what 1.7 million yeah. per year yeah. uh yeah. if it's a 20 million home that would be what uh, uh 3.4 yeah yeah 3.4 million per year so yes that investment is there and it will reward you in your old age mm-hmm. but then another investor who decided to go for a different asset is actually getting more than you and I don't think it's a proper allocation of capital okay yeah now there is obviously dead capital in the city yes. i'm sure you've seen around the kileleshwa area where you see a lot of flats yes. especially when you pass there by 6 pm yes. and then somebody at fifth floor yeah the lights are on yeah <laughs> maybe you come at 9 pm yeah. also maybe one or two people yeah there are a lot of apartments in Nairobi um and i think there has been that boom in housing yes. even around i think lemuru road you can see uh, some uh, houses which were basically built yes. and then left like that uh, they, there is no uh, you know progress on it yes. do you think in kenya for example there is a housing problem yeah. a deficiency in housing yes. or is it that people cannot afford these houses yes. or of course uh, there is a misallocation of uh, of funds to a problem that is not there well uh, i would say over the last 10 years yeah. uh, we have seen a very big boom in uh, high rise apartments around Nairobi area and uh, these apartments came in at uh, quite an expensive interest so majority of housing that you see around Nairobi is uh, built on based on debt so once these guys are done constructing these houses they either lease or sell and a majority of them are usually for sale so if you're buying a townhouse and it's going for let's say uh 10 15 20 million you realize that doing a comparative analysis it makes sense for someone to build that bungalow in the village compared to buying the townhouse because it comes with more expenses 
Once you build your house in the, in the village, you don't even have to pay DSTV. You'll only pay DSTV <laughs> when you get there. Yeah. And some, someone in the, at home can actually maintain that home. Actually, you can yeah. pay and then you just subscribe on, or tune in online there. Yes. Yeah. So, so if you have a gated community around town, you'll still incur expenses. So that may explain why we are seeing a lot of people building in their rural areas. Mm -hmm. But then for town, the way these guys build and the cost they are incurring, they basically transfer this to the end user, either the person who is purchasing or the person who is renting. So the rents are so high that people are not able to afford. So the economy has not been doing really nice. So you realize that there's a lot of people who are working in Nairobi and they don't want to occupy those spaces because they're expensive. So that leaves them to several adjustments that we are seeing. So on one side, we have seen the rise of uh, these rooftop bars and restaurants uh, on these high rises. So they are being turned into entertainment centers. They are also being turned into these Airbnbs as well as co-working spaces. Mm -hmm. And if you really look at co-working spaces, it's basically an adjustment where people are not able to afford an office, so they prefer sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned something, adjustments. I think that is why a lot of people, you'll find them thicker road, not because they live along thicker road. Yes. But they because come from thicker town, Juja, and they're far away from uh, Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, now you have come to a very interesting debate. Eh? Yeah. The houses are expensive in Nairobi, not just to buy, but also rent, yes. right? So there is a lot of apartment as well, yeah. which those spaces could have been used for other things. I think maybe a sports facility, something that is progressive to the society, right? Yes. And then um, there is the issue of big bungalows uh, in Nyanza, and that is status purposes, yeah? Yes. Now, do you still, with those realities of life, eh? yeah. does it really amount to a dead capital or maybe um, it is the hype within uh, the uh, the real estate uh, market that you see Rufus doing something, yeah. I would like to do it. Yes. So there is that hard uh, bandwagon that people do something because somebody did it and it looks nice. So. Well, I think housing is a necessity uh -huh. and uh, it's a free market, yeah. so it tends to balance itself. Uh -huh. So, well... We are seeing these houses that are basically empty, uh, especially in Nairobi area. Mm -hmm. So if they stay like that for the next couple of months, the owners themselves will have to adjust the rents lower. Okay. So it's a demand supply problem. Mm -hmm. So if you have excessive supply mm -hmm. and demand is low, then prices have to naturally come down. I'm asking so because um, yeah. when you see people, somebody saying, I want to build a home at, or something at home, right? Yes. And then somebody comes and says, I think you should do this and this, yes. right? So yeah. there's the aspect of financial literacy. Yes. And then there is the other one. Okay, I will not build this big bungalow, yeah. but I think I can build a rental space, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. So I tend to think if you build a home in the middle of nowhere, yes. let's say a rental space, four-story, four five-story building, costing almost the same amount, eh? yes. you will not get anybody because, first of all, you do not maybe have an access road to there. Yes. You do not have a demand of the housing. Yes. So, like, there is no the amenities, the basic amenities, maybe the toiletries or the water and maybe electricity coming there yes. and any other support services. Yeah. Obviously, securities are also important. Yeah. So. Is it that financial literacy is quite wanting? Yeah. Or people are, you see, it comes back to the issue of bandwagon mentality. Well, um, first I would say there has been a couple of experiences. Uh -huh. As you have, uh, we have mentioned with the 207 eight crisis uh, that happened uh, with our elections, yes. uh, the global financial crisis, uh, we have seen the COVID-19 crisis. So those crises have created this belief mm -hmm. or expectation that something bad could happen in the near future. So as a way of coping uh, to those conditions, mm -hmm. people start uh, creating their own places where they could fall back to. Okay. Yeah. Let me put that. So, uh -huh. On the other hand, housing is a necessity. Yeah. So you can't say it's because uh, Jesse is, uh, has bu already built a home in his rural home. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to build mine in my rural home. It's a reality. People yeah, are it, It's uh, a jealous. necessity. Now, yeah. The real question comes in. Yeah? yeah, people have been buying land around Nairobi, right? Yes. Uh, think of let. Uh, I'm not sure if your place the prices are always appreciating. Yeah. There is they always believe that land is a secure asset, yeah. and therefore it will always appreciate in price. Yes. So that comes the financial aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. And 
that has not been the case. I think most of the lands which I've appreciated are either next to a government project, maybe yeah. a railway is passing there, yes. or there is an intention to cross electricity, something like that, the um, uh, high voltage electricity transmission. Yeah. And uh, that has caused this belief, people buying land everywhere. Yes. Unfortunately, some get scammed by brokers and, yeah. uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, land tenderpreneurs. Yes. That comes, your literacy, how do you, in your case or in your region, yeah. advise somebody who has this amount of money yeah. but he still had to believe that land will appreciate whatever the, the price. What are some of the factors to look in before saying, this is what I'll do, at least regarding to that land? Well, uh, I would say uh, it's a feature uh, that is resulting from the last two governments. Uh -huh. So in the last 20 years, I think the biggest impact that the last two governments in Kenya have had is infrastructure development. So on Kibaki's time, uh, we saw some major roads being constructed. Uh, on top of that, uh, several uh, amenities, such as uh, hospitals, uh, security, uh, that is police force and so on, uh, water companies. Uh, there was a lot of development that went into that. Then Uhuru came and uh, raised the infrastructure board. There was uh, more access roads. Uh, right now, if you go to any part of the country, uh, you can see that there is a new tarmac that have been built within the last 10 years. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. So those access roads have basically made the land more valuable because uh, in a place where previously you could not have constructed a house, now you're able to construct a house and you can basically visit that uh, place every now and then. Okay. So that has literally added value to the land. Okay. Then, on the other hand, there are people who had bought the idle land without access, without those amenities, way back. They didn't even have electricity. The last mile project was not active. So before then, those people who bought that land, they enjoyed some very good appreciation, and um, they came in to sell th that land at much higher prices. Almost triple some of them, or even five times the original. Yes. Uh -huh. So... If you compare this with uh, what happened with M-Pesa, uh, when Safaricom started M-Pesa, they had agents, and those agents would establish shops, and then they would uh, basically offer Safaricom services, and they made some very good returns uh, at the beginning. But then, right now, if you are to open an M-Pesa shop, let's say in Westlands or somewhere, anywhere around Nairobi, mm -hmm. the returns are so minimal, you'd rather combine that M-Pesa with another business. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So those margins kept going down and down and down, and now almost everyone is using M-Pesa, so there are no withdrawals or deposits. So the same thing happens with land. So there was a, that time where the margins were really high, would make 5x, 10x your initial investment, but now the market is so crowded that finding another person to buy your land in military is becoming tougher and tougher. Yeah, uh, I don't know. There are circles which I've been in yeah. where even on the application, yes. you're able to find acres of land being sold and something like that. So mm -hmm. there is that uh, sort of IT involvement with it. Eh? Yes. I think there's always been talk about maybe regulating the prices of land yes. so that it doesn't go like you want to construct a home, but the land itself is too expensive to make sense for it. Yes. Uh, bottom line is uh, as much as... Uh, these fixed asset classes yes. are uh, less risky. Yes. They do demand due diligence, like, you know, trading gold, because, you know, they say don't follow the noise, yes. just make a clear thought uh, decision, yes. unaffected emotionally or, or, or hard mentality from whatever is happening out there. Yeah, on top of that, uh, there is uh, this new feature that came in, uh, especially during COVID, mm -hmm. where people are able to work remotely. Okay. So right now here in uh, FX Pesa, we have a hybrid system. Some employees are able to work from home a couple of days mm -hmm. and uh, from the office a couple of days. So that has significantly reduced the demand for office space within Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So in fact, this has spread so much that I have a couple of personal friends who have actually moved out of Nairobi. They are living in Meru, Eldoret, mm -hmm. Nakuru, and they are completely fine as long as they can deliver the same job. So that kind of a shift where people are able to move away from town where the lifestyle is expensive, mm -hmm has basically created uh, a vacancy. So there is a lot of vacant offices in Nairobi where previously there was so much demand because people had to work from the office. Yeah, I think in Kenyan situation, the over-concentration of all uh, economic allocation yeah. has been in Nairobi in such a way that it has led to other cities having the potential, yes. greater potential, I, I must say, yeah. than staying here in terms of cost of living is quite low yes. and everything else. Yeah? Yeah. So. 
I guess the summary is not all, say, housing that you build or land that you buy at your rural place yeah. could qualify as dead capital as maybe lo- al- some of those people in the conversation are saying. Yeah. Some are actually genuinely good investment decisions that you're making for yourself. Yes. And uh, if you intend to have a big family in the future, and obviously, uh, I think the best ones are the ones which I saw are overseeing the lake or something like that. Yes. I, um, do you think maybe with the BNB entering in Kenya, something like that, we could have a place like, I think, is it the Hamptons? Yeah. Uh, Hamptons, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly, yeah. whereby people are going for a holiday, yes. but it's you are living a fantasy. So you can book it for your family for like a whole week. You are on vacation instead of checking an hotel. Yes. You actually make your own meal. You have your family time, which is a sort of a progressive modern society and how to, you know, housing problem. Um, well, I would say it's a, it's a socioeconomic shift that has happened, especially with uh, Gen Z. Uh-huh. So the Gen Z we have right now, they tend to value experiences more than ownership. So if you compare with the earlier generations, uh, especially the boomers, they really valued owning something. Mm-hmm. Even if they were listening to music, yeah. they would literally buy an album, uh, yeah, they, 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 buy, they would buy a record, you know. Yeah. Uh, you buy an album, you buy a record, you have it, you own it. But then Gen Z, they have this kind of uh, scenario, situation, where almost everything they are consuming is uh, basically an experience rather than an ownership. Yeah. So if they want to listen to the newest, uh, let's say, song by Calligraph, they will basically just stream it mm-hmm. and then leave it there. <laughs> There's no sense of ownership there. Yeah. Just experience the song and that's it. So it, it has uh, spread so, fa- uh, so fast. So if, uh, let's say, it's a housing, they, they want to enjoy a really nice beachfront house, mm-hmm. they would just rather hire an Airbnb, go and experience it, get the experience and get out of there. Mm-hmm. So they leave you with the ownership, just get the experience and go. I mean, I mean, as we talk about BNB, I don't think like it's a, it's a this is a good business to get in. There are of course some costs and everything, and of course listing it up there. Yeah. So there might be some cost in there. Yeah. Somebody was telling me, and I, I live by this uh, quarter lot. Eh? Yeah. Uh, we all retire on experiences. Yes. Not on let's say a lot of money saved because at the end of the day, life is for the living. It doesn't mean that you be frugal. It doesn't mean that you of course are. Uh, <laughs> expedite yeah. your account to depletion at the moment uh, money gets in. Yes. But you make sure that every decision you make, besides the savings, a good investment, a good passive income uh, uh, program, yes. you also get to enjoy whatever amount of money you are earning. Yes. In, if it is a good trip, if yeah. it is maybe a good spa, if it is maybe a good drink, if it is maybe a good food, whatever it is, at least make sure that on your old age, you have a lot of stories to say yes. and something to to look back and be happy that actually I enjoy this. I think that is the point I usually, at least how I live my life. I don't know. Others mm-hmm. others are very restrictive on how they spend. I yeah. know people who will save literally all of their money yes. and they will keep it in the bank account or even in M-Pesa, M-Shwari and everything. Yeah. And there are those who will, when it comes, it goes. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, just passes <laughs> the account. Uh, I think uh, most a majority of our dreams are shaped at uh, childhood. So if you literally try and uh, explore uh, different dreams that people have, mm-hmm. they're basically shaped by where they grew up, the experiences they had as kids. So you'll find that um, for one person, the uh, let's say the dream of let's say living a big life, traveling to different countries, was shaped from when they were very uh, small. And then for some other persons, they just want to save their money, get their own bungalow, and then get off away from civilization. Yeah. yeah. Now, in regards to dead capital, the sourcing of the funds, yeah? Yeah. You know, uh, if you're employed, maybe in government, you always have this uh, uh, opportunity of borrowing at higher rates or even lower mortgage rates, depending on how your firm or your employer negotiates with the bank. Yes. Now, this person has 50 million, 10 million and of course, probably he has a car. Yes. And you know, there has been this conversation over time that cars are, uh, how do I put it? They are an expense, yes. not an investment, right? Yes. So you'll say, okay, instead of getting that, yeah. why don't you get a matatu, put it in a circle or something like that? Yeah. Why don't you get a small parcel, put it in Uber and everything? Yeah. Is that, what advice would you give such a person who is, has this capital, yeah. but there are three options or four options. There is the land, there is building a house, there is, of course, a Matatu or, a, or a Uber, you know. Yes. Uh, well, uh, when we talk of cars generally, we have to define them. 
Um, there are cars that are basically tools, uh, tools that basically help you do stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, the same way you would think of a, uh, of a smartphone. But then, uh, you can't say a, a smartphone is an asset or investment. It's a tool that helps you do other stuff. Yeah. So I would say it's a productivity tool or a utility tool. So I tend to view a car the same way. So it's a tool that helps you achieve other stuff. So, but then, cars are so wide. They, <laughs> uh, there's a 30 million car. And there's a 400k car. Yeah. yeah. There is a 150k car by the or even yes. 60k. Yes. Yeah, the scrap metal. <laughs> so, the shells. Uh, it really depends on what car you're talking about. If it's a utility car, it's really good. Uh-huh. Uh, if you go for a 20 million car, then now there are some investment trade-offs where there is the opportunity cost. Uh, if you had allocated this money in this particular asset versus buying this car, uh, how how would be the future outlook be? Uh-huh. How would that affect your balance sheet? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so even as you get the loan or of the financing, I think uh, the traders are quite uh, uh, interesting. Yeah, it's the same thing you said with the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say you want to have a nice home where anytime you want to visit your rural home, there is a nice house that you can settle. Mm-hmm. But then there's another person who is constructing a 30 million house. So there's a, there's a trade-off of where... Is it a, a place that you normally visit, let's say, three, four times a year, or let's say 10 times a year, mm-hmm. you spend a weekend and then come back to Nairobi, or is it a major investment where we can now start arguing, uh, would it have been a, a better way to invest this money in this other asset mm-hmm. compared to investing this money in your rural area? Yeah, I think it's a debate that will keep on going. Uh, you know, uh, for myself, uh, yeah. as I continue to grow older, you get the pressure from home, as usual, yeah. Yeah. to like make a good decision. So I want to see how the conversation will shape up in the future. Yeah. Other than that, uh, I think that's a good conversation. I don't know if there is anything you'll add on that. Uh, personally, as I always say, mm. um, if you're thinking of an investment, mm. uh, it could be, uh, let's say, in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, try to focus on the investment avenues available as different investment vehicles. So an investment vehicle may have a high speed, another one may have a slow speed or even a medium speed. So an investment vehicle with a high speed, it means that it's growth focused, meaning that there is a high chances of growth. But then it also tends to be risky. So if it's, a, let's say, a medium vehicle, medium moving vehicle, uh, it will be moving at a moderate speed, but at the same time, it has a moderate risk. So if it's a very slow uh, investment, maybe let's talk of a train, mm-hmm. uh, there's a low speed, but at the same time, lower risk. Mm-hmm. So you have to develop the right balance where you decide that if I'm investing in this, this is what I'm looking for. So if that works for you, mm-hmm. uh, then focus everything to make sure that you are pushing more money into that investment vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I hope uh, we will get to respond to some of the questions we get, and uh, uh, of course, um, uh, of course, uh, get to hear some of the opinions of our listeners. Uh, I've been your host, Jesse. Have yourself a wonderful day ahead. Mm-hmm.